Hello everyone and welcome to the Amaro Music Music Educator Repair Clinic. Joining me today I've got Mr. Seth Gaskell, a member of our Director Services team. Seth, good to see you. It's good to see you too, Nick. So today we're going to be talking timpani maintenance. Specifically timpani maintenance. one of the things that we see the most is just drum head replacement, a real standard repair. So tell us a little bit about this timpani. That's basically what we're going to be going over is uh, just changing and tuning a timpani head. Uh, what we have right here is a Yamaha it's part of their 6000 series. It's a good intermediate drum. And the biggest thing you'll notice is that it has got a balanced action pedal. This is what you'll see in 90% of band rooms. There are other pedal designs, but most of the time you see this heel toe action balanced pedal. And so a little bit about the anatomy of the drum. You have the frame here, which starts right under the counter hoop, the struts that go down to the bass, and then the pedal. The pedal inside has a spring that balances out the tension applied by the counter hoop. And so what you're looking for when changing a head is to balance the spring with the tension applied by the counter hoop that allows this pedal to stay balanced in position. And so on top of that, the biggest things you're gonna to need to know are that these are the tension rods or the tuning, uh, the tuning bolts. This is the counter hoop. And then of course, this is the head that we will be replacing. So Nick, if you want to grab the camera, I can show them some supplies that they're yeah, going to need to yeah, get this let's, operation Yeah, let's walk started. through some supplies here that you're going to be looking at. So we're going to change camera angles here and just do a little up close. Yeah, yeah. So first off, obviously you need your head. You need a block. This is a two by six. A two by four, roughly six to eight inches long will work just fine. Uh, this is some steel wool. This is extra fine. Fine will do. This is some naphtha, which we'll use to be cleaning various parts of the drum. It's just a stripper, or it's a paint stripper actually, so you can get it at the paint aisle at Home Depot, along with the steel wool. In fact, most of the supplies that you see on this bench are available at Home Depot. So you'll also need some Teflon spray. What we have here is white lithium grease. And then paper towels and rags, just because you're making a mess, you're gonna need to wipe down some of the parts. Uh, any kind of tape right here. We just have white electrical tape, uh, but we'll use that just to mark parts of the drum. A rubber mallet. This is kind of optional, but it might come in handy for some drums. A tape measure, a drum key, a mallet. I typically use this is a light staccato, but just kind of a medium hard mallet where you can hear the articulation of the drum and uh, without it being too abrasive. And then tuning mechanism. If you have a piano, just something that gives you a pitch. I have a uh, pitch pipe right here in the tuner. Uh, like I said, just something that gives you a pitch and a drum dial. So these are all the supplies you need. Great. Now tell us a little bit about the drum head that you've selected for this particular drum. I know there's different kinds of heads that you can select. And I know that there was some damage on this drum that actually kind of steered the direction that you selected for this particular head. Uh, yeah, so what this is, this is a, a Remo Renaissance drum. It's part of the RC series and it has a low profile steel insert. So I'm gonna come up close on that. So if you'll see, here, let me get rid of this cardboard real quick. So if you'll notice, this portion of the drum head is called the flesh hoop. That's a term that just lingers from the days when they actually use calfskin. And so it's typically where the uh, skin was attached to the frame of the drum. So it's called the flesh hoop. And on this, it has a steel insert. You can see that black steel right above the aluminum part of the flesh hoop. Okay. What this typically does is it creates a smaller contact point on the counter hoop, and it also lowers the drum or the actual head away from the counter hoop. And on top of that, it adds an extra, extra layer of rigidity and just kind of helps reinforce the drum head. And with a drum that's sustained some damage, this any edge and tuning and overall stability is just it's a big help. So that's why I've selected this drum head. And it sounds great. Great. And I'll show, just in case any other educators uh, take note of, of what we found. So when we have this drum, it's just typical of a lot of middle schools uh, and high schools. But you did notice that we found this particular crack right here. And so, Seth, when selecting that drum head, you just felt like it was important to have something that had that additional rigidity, a little extra stability when yeah. tuning the drum? It's not necessary, but it helps a lot. Um, yeah, so the great thing about this drum is it is actually a middle school drum donated or uh, loaned to us from one of our schools 
uh, for this clinic, and it is in middle school condition. So you'll get to see a lot of problems that you'll probably go through as a band director. Uh, but yeah, like I said, these get moved from football fields to different band halls, different practice rooms. And so and they're, they get tipped over, they're moved by kids. Uh, this counter hoop's gonna take a lot of damage. And so over the course of years, it's not gonna be completely in round. And so, yeah, uh, this is just an example over here, some damage that was sustained, uh, just probably moving the drum. And of course, this is a new drum head that we have on here because we've recorded this clinic multiple times thanks to some technical difficulties, yeah. as some of our viewers will know. But this particular drum head is, is, of course, new. Tell me some of the signs when it becomes time for you to replace uh, a timpani drum head. Sure thing. Okay, so what you'll most of the time notice is that there are dents in the head uh, around here, the, the bearing edge of the actual bowl of the drum, the rim of the drum, you'll see a lot of nicks. A lot of times there are little tiny just micro tears. Uh, this is a finished uh, or a coated head. And so it's actually got a coating that makes it resemble the warmth and tone that you get from calf skin. And so a lot of times you'll see where, the, where that uh, coating might get peeled up. Uh, but the biggest indicator is when you try to tune the drum, if it's just overly distorted and you never actually get to a point where you can get a true pitch out of the, out of the drum head, a lot of times that's just a sign that it needs to be replaced. And a typical drum head needs to be replaced every one to two years. One is ideal, but we obviously understand that schools are on a budget and every year sometimes it's just not attainable. And so you can push them to two years. After that, they probably definitely need to be changed. But again, I know that sometimes they need to get pushed out a little further and they can make it a little further than that, but ideally one to two years, just depending on the budget. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and start working our way into this particular timpani, into this particular drum. Yeah. But before we do, I know there's one little safety tidbit that you yeah. want to share with everybody. So the first thing you'll need is your block. And so the block is to go under the pedal. And as you undo the tension on these, tuning, on these tension rods, the spring attached to the pedal will have nothing to balance out its tension. So the natural position of the pedal wants to be forward, you know, and so this block, as you're undoing it, will keep the pedal from snapping forward. Um, I've heard stories of pedals getting hung, and you release all the tension off the counter hoop, and that pedal will kind of give way and snap forward. Uh, it's not common, but it can happen. It causes damage to the drum, and uh, God forbid that there are any fingers or any body parts in the way because it could do some serious damage. Gotcha. So the first thing is just secure the drum, uh, the pedal, keeping yeah. in mind that the, the tension from that spring is trying to pull the pedal forward. We'll pull so the pedal we just forward. want to block that off. Great. Yeah. And so as far as removing the drum head, since it's being replaced, it kind of doesn't matter what order you want to go. Uh, but I typically just out of habit will whichever tension rod that I do first, I'll go ahead and work on the opposite side. Now I know as you're preparing to do that, one of the other tricks is also to mark the drum and mark the hoop. Am I using the correct terminology here? Yeah, the counter hoop. Yeah, so the counter hoop. So tell me why that's an important step before you take off the counter hoop and remove it from the drum. Well, as we said before, the drum will sustain damage over years of use. Uh, so any imperfections that the counter hoop has sustained over time, it's just better to keep those in the exact same position. Uh, it's, it's where the, uh, the frame is taking damage, where the counter hoop's taking damage and possibly the bowl of the drum, hopefully not the bowl, but it is a possibility. And so you just wanna at least keep that damage consistent. Okay, so the, it's to be expected that the drum is not perfectly round. Uh, yes. The counter hoop is not perfectly round, and so it's acceptable, but our goal is just to return those imperfections to the same spot. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then tell me a little bit about the different materials that the bowls can be made out, made out of, because I know we're, this one is a, a copper, correct? This is a copper bowl. Uh, typically your nicer drums are made from copper. Not typically, they always are. Uh, some cost-saving measures on lower, lower end drums will be made of fiberglass. 
Uh, and then some companies also offer an aluminum model or aluminum bowl, uh, but this is the best material that a timpani bowl can be made from, yeah, which is copper. And beyond this, this is just a smooth copper bowl. Uh, there are companies that will they have hammered copper, uh, cambered copper, and typically that's just an extra manufacturing procedure that's done by hand that will increase the complexity of the tone. And so you don't see it a lot in school model drums and we're, it typically starts to come along. You look at university level, pro level drums. All right, so I'm just gonna peel off two pieces of tape here. That's exactly what I need. Okay, there's one, kind of wrinkled up. Sorry about that. That's all right. Like I said, it just needs something to mark it with. Perfect. It doesn't have to be pretty. So if you'll see, I'm marking the part of the counter hoop and a part of the frame, this strut right here, where the counter hoop needs to be returned. Okay. Let's see, take that drum head. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now one of the more important things you can do when changing uh, a timpani head is to clean the bearing edge. The bearing edge here is the curve of the bowl. And so it's at the point where the head makes contact with the bowl of the drum. And uh, if you'll notice, there can be some burrs, uh, some accumulation, some dirt on a bowl that builds up, which will just interfere with the tone quality and the way the head slides over the bearing edge. And if there's enough of, there's an abrasive enough of a piece of dirt under the head, it can actually tear through the head, which obviously just, is uh, no bueno. So that's why we have our naphtha and our steel wool. I'll be your paper towel guy here for you. Yeah, yeah, you might need to. So again, for the steel wool, we've just got the um, fine or the ultra fine, is that right? It's just some, yeah, extra fine steel wool. Okay. I'm going to need something to pry this open with. But yeah, obviously you don't want anything too abrasive. You don't want to actually damage the bearing edge. Uh, but steel wool also gives you enough, this extra fine gives you enough bite to get through all the corrosion that's built up over time. Okay. So just apply a little bit. It doesn't have to be too much. And you're just flipping it just straight onto the steel wool. And then I noticed your technique there is actually to, to kind of roll the steel wool down and out away from the inside bowl of the drum. Yeah, any dirt, any corrosion that you're cleaning up, you don't want to really just smear it around the bearing edge. You kind of want to wipe it away. Yeah, because I would, you know, my natural tendency would be to come in and just kind of wipe around the drum like yeah, this. Yeah, and you could just be smearing it across the bearing edge and kind of defeating the purpose. So you want to wipe it away from the drum. So it doesn't really need a, a hard scrubbing here. No, right, in not theory, there should be no imperfections from the manufacturing of the drum. It should just be a matter, like you said, of removing that debris. Just, yeah, this is the corrosion, the grime that builds up over time being of disuse. Uh, now you will notice that there might be some imperfections in the bearing edge just from items falling on the drum, just taking a couple of shots. Uh, on this one in particular, I noticed that there are some nicks in the copper, if you can notice those. Okay. Uh, those aren't major. If you had any burrs that are really sticking up, it's just a copper burr. That's obviously going to cause damage to the head, and right. that will need to be something that needs to be corrected. And Joel, these... they're, they're so small. Oh, there's a little one right there. Yeah. So you can kind of see just that tiny, tiny little nick there. And so that's nothing to really be concerned about. In the... That's nothing to be concerned about at all. You do want to check for sharp edges, anything that's going to like stab through the drum head, basically. And so we don't have any of those here. But yeah, you just want to make sure that you get all the dirt, that you feel no more burrs, any corrosion there. Okay. And then I like to take one more pass and kind of reapply, and then you can just kind of go around. Okay. And so now we have a clean bearing edge, and we're ready for our Teflon spray. Now, Teflon spray, uh, there. There are a couple of different methods that you can use. I'm using Teflon spray. 
there is Teflon tape uh, that's available and drum manufacturers either make their own or source Teflon tape that works with their specific models of drums. Um, I'm going to grab our extra piece of cardboard because yeah. as we learned, uh, practice a little this, messy. Yeah, yeah it, can, it can overspray a little bit and you can get it across the classroom. All right, so just two to three inches away from the bearing edge and let's go, Nick. Okay. So yeah, the cardboard from the drum head works nicely it to does, yeah. pick up the overspray there. And if you'll notice, this Teflon spray is a dry lubricant. Uh, you can see it drying before you. I don't know if you can see it or not. But yeah, it's I got, kind of, a, got, I got like a, a kind of a camera shot of it here. You can see is it, it's just a bit of a white hue. And so it dries quickly. Um, and all this, what this is designed for is just to reduce friction. And so as you put the drum head on it, obviously that counter hoop will be moving up and down as you tune the drum using the pedal. And this allows for the, the plastic head just to glide over the bearing edge a little more smoothly. And so it can make a big difference. Now as it dries, you want to check for any spots you might have missed. So that is a little different from like a WD-40 or some other like petroleum-based or liquid-based in that this is going to dry and the lubricant is actually in the... The, uh, the powder or the dry part that gets left behind. Yeah, yeah, this is a little thin layer of Teflon. There are some silicon-based lubricants that, uh, that work the same way that you can use. Um, I've just always used Teflon spray. Like I said, there's also Teflon tape uh, that's used by a lot of people. So it really just, just depends on your preference. But the Teflon spray is a, just easy to apply, easy to deal with. Uh, one coating typically does it. If you'd like, you can go over it twice, but it's most of the time not necessary. Great. And so now we are ready for our head replacement. Great. Now, is there any, any, I know on this particular drum, we've done a little practice run, any type of cleaning that can be done on the inside of the drum, if there's erasers or pencils or I'm glad you reminded else? me. At this point, since this is the only opportunity you're really gonna have to get inside the drum, because uh, once you remove a drum head, it's, it's not wise, especially a timpani, to use the exact same drum head. It's been seated and formed to the bearing edge, and it's just really, really hard to find that sweet spot again. And so, but yes, while you have the drum off, you want to wipe down any dirt or debris that's in it. Obviously, there's not much in here. Uh, if you find anything that's kind of stuck on, you can just use something very light to clean it with. So what are some of the chemicals that would be safe to use on the inside of a timpani? Uh, most of the time, I would just start off with a little bit of water and see if you can cut through the dirt, dry it off immediately, make sure the dust is out. But uh, you could probably you could use some like, isopropyl alcohol, just very lightly, and that kind of helps cut through grime. And so also, one more thing, the rubber mallet, which we do not need right now, but if you have any copper or aluminum timpani, especially if they have any significant age to them, then you might notice that they're actual dents to the bowl itself. Uh, fortunately, this drum, the bowl's in great condition. I can't see any imperfections as far as that's concerned, but I have seen some drums that have sustained huge dents. And uh, this is just a rubber mallet. You can use an automotive mallet as well. And what you want to do is just lightly tap those dents out. It's not going to be perfect, but you want to get the bowl uh, as close to its original uh, parabolic state as it was in before the damage was sustained and that just allows the bowl to resonate more freely. And so if needed, you can use a rubber mallet to kind of knock those dents out, get it close to where it was before. Probably not an activity to let your students do though. Probably not, probably not. <laughs> just uh, gonna you'll you'll notice there. A, li a little will do you on this. And so if you'll also notice on a, on a timpani drum head, you want to have the logo placed on the opposite end of the playing surface, which the playing surface is in between these two struts right here. And these are manufactured in a way where the backbone of the drum head was basically just the way the, the mylar was machined and the way it was stretched. So you're playing in line with that. And so they typically mark the logo on timpani head to show you where the backbone was, which will give you your best playing surface, it should approximately be where it should be. And that's not always the case. You kind of get in the weeds with that. But typically saying you want the, uh, the logo on the opposite end of the playing surface. Great. And while we have this here and the, and the head is available, 
What size drum is this, and how do we know what size head to put to that pick out for the drum? That's a great question. Okay, so this is a 26 inch drum, but you'll notice that the head extends far beyond the bowl. That's because the drum itself is 26 inches. And so By drum, you mean the actual bowl, the, the copper piece The actual bowl here. is 26 inch. So as, as what you're playing on, what's resonating is the 26 inch drum. Uh, but since 1978, basically if you have timpani that have been purchased since 1980, there's a good chance that they're extended collar heads. And so if you'll notice, there it goes. The, the counter hoop extends beyond the diameter of the bowl yeah, by about an inch on each side, two inches around. in total. Yeah. So, which that means this is basically a 28 inch counter hoop on a 26 inch drum. But since the drum head needs to fit securely under the counter hoop, you will need a 28 inch drum or 28 inch rim, 28 inch head to fit your uh, 26 inch drum. And, and so that, that's a little unique from other drums in which I know a lot of times like with bass drums or snare drums, you typically measure the inner diameter of the, of the drum itself, isn't that correct? Typically the collar of a drum head is much closer to the, the right. rim of the drum or the bearing edge of the, the drum shell or the bowl in this instance. But as you can see on timpani, that collar, if you can see through the bearing edge here, like I said, it extends roughly an inch on any side, and the two inches in total. Uh, like I said, that's, that was a change that was made in 1978, and it typically helps with clarity of articulation, just overall tone quality. Uh, allows the head to stretch over the bearing edge more freely. Uh, it, also, it resonates a little more freely and makes the drum to sound that much better. Uh, that being said, there are still plenty of drums out there that are 26 inch drums with a counter hoop that sets pretty close to being flush with the, the bearing edge of the bowl, and those would require 26 inch. So when it comes to head selection, the best way to make sure that you're getting the proper size head for your drum is to know the make and model of the drum itself. Uh, get with your local expert, call us, and we can help you find it if you can't find that information on your own. If not, then when you're replacing the head to measure the outside diameter, of the drum head itself. So from the outside of the flesh hoop here to the opposite end, so the outside diameters, and then you can order heads based on that measurement you get. Those are the two best ways of knowing. Other than that, there's really no surefire way to know. You just have to look up that information, which is readily available through most manufacturers' websites. And obviously you can call us. We can help you with any questions you may have. So just out of curiosity, why not just put the head directly on the drum? Why do you like to put it in uh, the counter hoop first. You're going to have to seat the drum head anyways, which I will show you what that means in just a second. And it's easier for me if I just already have in the counter hoop. Okay. Okay. Now at this point, you'll want to start just oh. attaching. Don't give me too much, Nick. Don't even get them all the way down. Yeah. Just, just, just get them started. You're obviously much faster at this because I'm still working on my first one. Oh, I don't anything. Now, if, uh, if you get into this project, Seth, and you notice that these bolts that we're working with right here might have a little grime or buildup, is there a maintenance opportunity while you have the, the drum disassembled on these as well? There is. Once we get this going, Alright, you have all your ears in? I believe so. Just just the first couple of twists there. Alright, let's see. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and undo one of them. Let me find one that's particularly grimy. These are all pretty decent. What you'll want to do is take your naphtha. And a rag. Let's see. You know what I did with my. Set your screwdriver right over there on top yeah. of the chair. Okay, yeah. Our little pry screwdriver there. Now, 
So the same stuff we're using before. We've just got a little microfiber or a little cloth. This is great for cleaning machine parts. And Tempany is just chock full of machine parts. So this will, you just want to put a little bit on a rag and clean off any dirt and debris. And you can do this to all your tension rods as this is the best opportunity because they won't come off again until it's time to replace the next timpani head. Okay. So you can see. Yeah, cleaned up very nicely. Yeah, you get the yeah, grime the off almost the shine instantly. definitely returned. At this point, you'll take your white lithium grease. And you don't need much. Just a dab on the bottom. And a little on the side. And that'll kind of work into the drum, into the casing as you uh, screw the bolt in. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's almost like as much toothpaste as you would put on like a, a toddler's toothbrush. I mean, basically, I, I, yeah. I hate it's to say it's a much. toothbrush size, it's just a, a little bitty dab. dab. And of course, you know, as a parent to a five year old, that's the closest association <laughs> I can come up with there off the top of my head. And so, obviously, you'd want to do these to all tension rods, but for the sake of time, we're just going to do it to the one. Okay, at this point, just going finger tight. Yeah, I got it. Okay. At this point, you want to get them as tight as you can with the fingers while maintaining even pressure. So again, we put this on, we've got our tape lined up between the two pieces. So the counter hoop is going in the exact same position that it was before. And before you tighten these all the way up, you'll want to make sure the drum head is seated. And this is incredibly important. What do you mean by seated? Let me show you. Okay. So we are dealing with extended collar drums. And the collar of the drum is the portion of the drum head that's in between the bearing edge and the counter hoop. So this is the collar. And since this is a 26 inch drum and a 28 inch head, then obviously there should be roughly an inch in between each tension rod and the bearing edge of the, of the, yeah. you know, the bearing edge of the drum. Well, and I can just see, I'm sure with our overshot cam, you can see this too. Just eyeballing this, I mean, it looks like this distance Uneven, is yeah. less than this, and so that's what you're talking about here, looking to be sure that we're seated right over the center of the, both the head and the drum. And I mean, how exact do the tolerances need to be when you're seating this drum here, Seth? Uh, as exact as you can get it. If not, once you actually start tuning the drum, bringing it up to pitch, you'll notice a lot of wrinkling in the, uh, the collar of the drum, and I mean, you're just never gonna get a proper tuning if, uh, if the drum head's coming off that way. But that's just basically just uneven pressure being applied to the drum head, which will cause one portion of it to wrinkle. And if you notice that when you first start tuning a drum, it's okay, undo the tension bolts and try to reseat it. So we're looking at about an inch from halfway through the counter hoop to the bearing edge. And again, this will not be perfect as this drum has sustained some damage in the past, uh, particularly to the counter hoop. And so there are two trouble spots that I noticed the last time we were doing this, this drum. And I'll show you where those are in a minute. So already we're looking at about three quarters of an inch right here. And keep it in mind too, if it's a quarter of an inch off, then you, you just want to slide it up about half of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's going to subtract the other, you know, half on one side, half on the other side. Whatever you're doing to one side of the, uh, of the drum on is the other. Yeah. doubled on the other. So this part can be tedious, but necessary. Well, I assume if you get this part right, then actually tuning the drum and beginning to apply pressure to the head goes much, much faster. Much, much faster. It's, it's much, more, much more of a productive session. Okay. And tell us, and you mentioned trouble spots on this particular drum. Just so in case another educator experiences something similar, what do you notice? I notice that the distance where this strut's broken actually uh, is typically on this side, it's a little longer, which means on this side, it's going to be a little shorter. And that's exactly what it is. And so, like I said, you may not be able to get these perfect 
once a drum has sustained this kind of damage, but it should not stop you from trying to get it as close as possible. Okay. This head is properly spaced. Great. All done, right? All done. So at this point, I would apply as much tension as I can with my finger to a point where you just can't get it to turn anymore before you resort to using the key. Now, if you'll notice that the tension bolts are uh, four-sided, so you want one of those flat sides laying flush with the drum. And this will allow you to just properly manage actual turns you're making with the drum key once you get started bringing it up to pitch. So you're turning each one, just a, a very partial turn, with the intent of bringing one of those four faces Flush. pointed towards the center of the drum. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. And in doing so, <clears throat> excuse me, that'll help you count how many partial turns you've made on each individual exactly. tension bolt. Okay. So at this point, the great thing about the drum key is it's either if, if you have one of these sides flush with the counter hoop, it'll either be flush with the counter hoop well or, as well or perpendicular to it. So it's a good way of just giving you a visual on how many turns you've made, okay. how much tension you've applied. Let me make sure I have all those. Because whatever you do to one tension rod, you're going to want to do the exact same thing to the rest of them. Yeah, this is much more exact than just turning your wrist a half turn or a quarter turn with each one. Yeah, you really want to monitor how much tension you're applying to each drum head or each tension rod. And then the key that you have, I mean, is, is that just a timpani tuning key, a general drum key? It's a timpani tuning key uh, that's pretty specific to uh, makes and models of drum. I, I know that a lot of times you can get a generic drum key for your drum set or your snare drum, they work. Uh, but the Ludwigs typically take Ludwigs, and uh, Yamaha typically takes a Yamaha key. I know that Adams drums, if you have those, those are definitely, I think they're hexagonal bolts. And okay. So they definitely require their own key, and they're, they're fairly large. So if you so, don't have your, your timpani drum key before you start this project, that's something you can't just use a regular snare drum tuning key. Uh, no, no, yeah, you can, definitely cannot. These are all a little larger, so you'll need a drum key, uh, preferably provided by the, the maker of your drums. Okay. And so... At this point, we're ready to bring it up to tension. Uh, like I said, you want to apply even tension to each tension rod. So whatever I do to one side of the drum, I immediately want to do to the other side. So a good pattern is, uh, a good tuning pattern is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And when you're first bringing the drum up to pitch, you really want to make sure that you're following that just so that every tension rod receives the same adjustment. So it's not the traditional star pattern, but you're kind of going over and then one, you know, you're going across and then one over. Yeah, that's exactly and then it. And move next one over, go across, move next one over, go across. All right, so, so we have the new head on. We've got it centered all the way around the drum, and I know we're ready to start adding some tension. But before we do that, tell me a little bit about what our tuning goals are and what we're really looking for out of this particular drum. Okay, so with each drum, you need to know the range that drum is designed to be tuned to. So a typical set of timpani is a 23-inch, a 26-inch, a 29-inch, and a 32-inch drum. And in average range, like I said, it can vary uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer, but you're looking at the 32 inch having a range, they all have a range of a fifth, the 32 inch having a range from a D to an A, the 29 inch having a range from an F to a C, and then the only outlier is the 26 inch which has an average range of a B flat to an F, and then you look at the 23 inch and it's gonna have a D to an A as well. Uh, there's sometimes the addition of a 20 inch, it's a smaller drum that completes a full set of five, uh, it's needed for some literature, it makes some literature easier, and it's needed for some solo literature, but uh, a typical set of drums is a 23 inch to 32 inch uh, set. But if you do have the 20 inch, then it is also an F to a C. So the only outlier is the 26 inch, which is what we have here. 
Uh, it sounds great from a B flat to an F. This particular model, like I said, there are, it does vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but this one is designed to be tuned to a half step below that B flat, so it goes from an A to an F. Um, and so now that we have it seated, it's centered, we have all the tension rods finger tight, we're ready to start bringing the pitch up to its fundamental. Uh, and our goal is to tune to the fundamental of the drum, which like I said on this one is an A. And so I have the key in my pocket. We're gonna start off, since we have a lot more space here, obviously you can hear it's just floppy and there's no tension to it yet. We're going to do one full turn. And so that's a half and one. You'll immediately want to do that to the other side. Again, landing back where you start with the face of the drum key uh, facing inwards towards the drum. Just to give you a good <coughs> reference of where you stand. We're following that tuning pattern we discussed earlier. There are other ways to tune the drum. There are other tuning patterns. But this is a great one. Now typically, we're probably gonna end being a minor third, roughly a minor third below the fundamental of the drum, but we're still nowhere close. At this point, you wanna have your, uh, your pitch pipe, your piano, your tuner, whatever gives you a pitch. Okay, so we're still quite a bit lower, but we will now immediately start making smaller adjustments because you get there relatively quick. So I did do a full turn that first time through. This time I will do a half turn. The same pattern, starting, following the same pattern that you did before, starting in the same place. And whatever you do to one tension rod, you want to do to all of them. You don't want to get it out of balance. Now at this point, you'll probably need to start using your pedal a little bit. And now there has been enough tension applied to the counter hoop and the head to balance out that spring so you won't have any issues with the pedal holding. There you go. And now you want to take your mallet and find out how far away you are from an A. We're still going to be below it, but we should be getting closer. So still quite a bit lower. Now we're even going to make smaller adjustments. This time, instead of a half turn, I'm going to make quarter turns. Okay, so I had to tune up to get to the A, so we're still not quite there. And we saw a new tuning technique here, Seth. Was that you humming into the bowl? If you hum the pitch, uh, like I just hummed an A into the bowl and tuned the pedal up until the drum started singing uh, sympathetically back to me. And it's a good way to like, if you're in the middle of, uh, in the middle of tuning a drum, just pedal tuning uh, to find the pitch. So we're gonna continue with our quarter turns. Okay, so I had to make even a smaller adjustment to get up to that A that time. We're getting very close. And now that we're so close, I'm gonna start with just adjusting the, uh, the playing tension rods and their corresponding. Now, <clears throat> so on that particular one, you brought the, the drum up to pitch by leaning forward on the pedal a little bit. Yeah. Did you back the pedal back down so we now have our pedal back all the way down again? It's back down at the fundamental. Okay. So the, when, you, when you use the word fundamental, you're also referring to the pedal being in the lowest. The fundamental um, pitch, yeah, is, is the pitch that you want to tune the drum to when the pedal is in its lowest position. Okay. So. so we're still looking for that fundamental, but the pedal is in the position that the fundamental should be played in. Yes, yes exactly. Gotcha. Okay, so on this one, we just adjusted four 
Two being where the uh, performer plays, yeah, and right then between. the two corresponding across. Yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, that's even a smaller adjustment to the A at this point. We're going to make quarter turns to the remaining four tension rods. So one of the dangers I would assume would that pe people would want to make the adjustments only to these four because these are the four that the on the side of the drum that the player plays on. Yes, yeah, but you want to keep even tension across the entire head. Uh, but just as you get closer to the pitch, adjusting every single tension rod may push you over. So at that point, you you focus on the the first four, the the tension rods closest to the playing area of the drum. And then if further adjustments need to, make, need to be made, then you'll work on the remaining four. Okay. Okay. So this last, to last go round, we did a quarter turn on the two outside on either side. And so now I assume we're going to return back to the two closest to you. We're going to stick with quarter turns. It'll get to a point where you even make smaller adjustments. We're just going to start with these four. Okay, and at that point, I barely moved the pedal, but we're still a little flat. Okay, so we're close to our A. The next thing you want to look for is just a clear, consistent tone when you first strike the drum. Don't worry about the overtones that are going to come as the uh, tone starts to decay. Just look for something consistent when you first strike the drum. And we're going to be playing between the two uh, tension rods closest to the playing area, which the playing area is in between these two, about four inches into the drum. We're going to find out which one of these sounds the best. So what I'm finding is this one's a more consistent tone. Okay. There are less dips. This one had some dips in it uh, right off the bat. So that, that one also sounded a hair flatter to me. It did. It did. So that's really not what we're, when you say the better tone, we're really not looking for in tune. We're looking for tone quality. Yeah, we're still just getting a start here. And at this point, since we're that close to the A, we found a great quality of tone closest to this tension ride. We're going to use our drum dial, which is just a great tool to uh, help us. It just measures mechanical tension of the head. And so any tension rods that are out of whack uh, now can be fine-tuned using the drum dial. I'm going to set this one to zero. And we'll be looking to match the tension of all other tension rods. So you're zero, zero. in this out to zero. Damn, I moved it a little too much. And so this is going to be the, basically the, the baseline tension that we're going to measure the rest of the drum to. Yeah, yeah. We're going to see where we stand. All right, so Seth, we've gone around. We've, got, uh, we've, we've tuned the drum. So we're playing our, our low fundamental note again was the A. We have an A tune now. We, we can play up to the F. And I noticed that you were just kind of working away a little bit with the drum dial. We've got uh, equal tension moving around all of the different tension rods here. But just tell me exactly what it is that you were looking for in that and why sometimes that's as much of an art and just kind of tinkering with the drum. Um, so basically, we, you get up to your fundamental pitch. You find something that's clear and consistent and stable. And then after you let it set for about 10 minutes, you come back and you play in that same playing surface again and listen for any dip or rise in the, in the overtones. And I'm not even talking about just the overall decay of the volume of the drum. I'm talking about uh, the overtones actually leaning sharp or flat. 
And at that point, if you hear some overtones leaning flat, uh, you still wanna base it off your best sounding uh, playing area. And then you want to find the tension rods that might be a little low or a little high, depending on if those uh, overtones are, are tending towards flat or sharp. And you want to adjust those. And that's when you get to clearing the head. And so once you've kind of gotten those back on track, uh, then the drum as fundamental should sound a lot more pure. And that's when you have a tuned timpani. And at the end of it, you'll want to set it, let it set for a couple of days as the head will stretch and form across the bearing edge. The pitch will probably drop and you'll have to tune it up just slightly and uh, you'll have to go through the clearing of the head process again. So, so everything we just went through, again, it just, it just takes a little time, but what you're saying is, is, hey, don't be frustrated if you come back three days later. In fact, expect to come back three days later. Especially at the new head, yeah. And have to go through this process one more time. So, so you more than likely find the head flat in two or three days from now. Yes, as it stretches, it'll typically go flat. Uh, but the adjustments you make at that point are very minor. They're very small. And uh, just to get the drum up to pitch or just make just slight tuning changes, just clearing the head to give you an overall pure tone. Fantastic. Well, at this point, is it safe for us to say that this head has been replaced and the drum is playing in tune? Yes. The drum plays as fundamental as it, and it will make it all the way up to its F. And I fully expect this to go a little flat over the next couple of days. And that's typical of a head change. And that's when I'd come back in and just clear the head. Great. So. Awesome. Well, Seth, thanks so much for coming You're and welcome. sharing some of your Thank expertise. You this is absolutely wonderful. And listen, if there's anything that we can do here at Amro Music to help you out, again, this is Seth Gaskell. We've got his counterpart, Alan Compton, and Linda O'Brien up in the Director Services Office. This is what they do. They are percussion experts. They are here to serve all of you. So if you have any questions, if you need help picking the right head for your drum, sizing the particular head, just want to walk through and get some more details, all you have to do is contact Seth. We'll leave that phone number in the description. Uh, for this particular video, you can also text message with these guys and they can get you squared away as well. And hey, as a quick reminder, if you enjoyed today's conversation and you want to hear more conversations just like it, you can follow the After Hours Conversations for Music Educators podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts, we sit down with expert music educators, band directors, administrators, and just all around great people and have conversations just like this to help you be a better educator in the classroom. From all of us here at Amro Music, thanks for doing what you do and we'll see you next time. Thank you.